back to the vlog. So today we're going to cover the tip of the iceberg on a monster of a subject, FPGAs. Now, this is a topic that you could literally build an entire YouTube channel around, and we're going to cover the bare basics in probably about 10 minutes or less. Now, I'm going to simplify this immensely. Some people with a little knowledge of FPGAs might argue it's simplified too much, but given the nature of this topic and how gnarly it can get in the face of any attempt to make it understandable in a comprehensive way to the masses, there's going to be a little bit of glossing over in certain areas, and maybe the odd analogy that is going to get a concept across, but whilst it's technically inaccurate, it does kind of get the gist of what is happening. <laughs> Anyway, uh, like a perfect example of this will be when we get to the bucket of soup. Uh, so anyway, uh, just a disclaimer that uh, you know there is no soup or buckets for that matter in an FPGA. So if you have an issue with any of this, you're probably not the intended level of viewer that this video is created for. Now, with this out of the way, most people, especially those that watch this channel, are aware of what a CPU is. In short, it's a chip full of transistors and logic gates that once manufactured cannot be changed, but its intended function can be changed through the use of different software. This contains instructions on which logic gates and registers uh, to use and in what order to accomplish many different tasks. The CPU doesn't know what peripherals are, so you end up with other integrated circuits uh, or ICs that are bundled on a motherboard alongside the uh, processor and pluggable cards that handle things like graphics and storage and other chips that handle Wi-Fi and so on. And all these other things like you know you normally find in a standard computer. So that's the CPU. Now some people might know what a microcontroller is. It's kind of like a CPU, it's a chip full of transistors and logic gates uh, that once manufactured also cannot be changed. But these normally come with uh, peripheral I.O. of a very basic level built in, allowing them to measure signals and send signals like a CPU would. But unlike a CPU, it has a kind of an awareness of the pins and peripherals that it's connected to, uh, allowing for things like automation of uh, I know, tasks like measuring voltages on a pin uh, you know, or controlling other devices such as motors. Usually, unlike a CPU, there is a comparatively slow clock. Uh, you know, there's not so many instructions and very few pins, and the cost is like just orders of magnitude lower. So that's a microcontroller. Next, some people might know what a breadboard is. So you know, you can plug in resistors, LEDs, logic gates, and other items to build a hardware circuit that performs a specific task. When you power it up, it does the one thing that you set it up for over and over again, regardless of how many times you you know power it up, unless you fry it. Um, yeah, when you're done, you just tear everything out of it, and you know you can rebuild something else entirely. So that's the breadboard. Now, imagine let's take the you know three things that you just saw and we merged them all together. Now you have a chip that acts something like a computer or a microprocessor but can also be wired up on the fly by software to do specific tasks when you power it on, just like your breadboard components would. This is the concept of an FPGA. So FPGA stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. Uh, what this translates into in plain English uh, is field programmable, meaning that you can change the internal hardware wiring of the chip's logic after it's shipped from the factory, if you really wanted to, you could literally program it in a field surrounded by cows. <laughs> and a gate array, uh, which translates into a collection of gates and logic stuff that basically sit in like a virtual bucket of soup, uh, consisting of a certain number of uh, you know gates, AND gates, NOT gates, flip-flops, uh, transistors, and other bits of integrated circuitry that you can then tell the FPGA to wire up those components, uh, you know, string them together, to but just take what you need from that bucket. And so, you know, some of these components can be software routines too. So finally, you bind your hardware circuit to the external pins around the chip so that it can then take signals from the outside world and send responses in return. 
So that's an FPGA. If this sounds complicated, <laughs> that's because it is. Now, things get even more complicated when you realize that this chip can wire up in parallel and have, in the case of this chip, up to four separate circuits running in tandem, totally independent of each other, but you can connect them together if you want to. Now, if you think USB's naming scheme was bad, you gotta get a load of this. To program one of these, you're going to have to end up in one of two languages. Uh, you've got VHDL and Verilog HDL. HDL means Hardware Description Language. Okay, that's kind of self-explanatory. It's a language that describes hardware. Verilog HDL is just Verilog's version of HDL. So it's their version of a Hardware Description Language. However, the V in VHDL is short for VHSIC, or Very High Speed Integrated Circuit, meaning that VHDL is short for the very cumbersome name Very High Speed Integrated Circuit Language Hardware Description Language. No, I got that wrong, didn't I? It's <laughs> Very High Speed Integrated Circuit Hardware Description Language. Now, if you're thinking that this sounds very militaristic uh, to have a cumbersome name distilled down to a few raw letters, uh, you know, you would actually be right. Uh, you know, this is no coinky dink. It was all part of a 1980s US government program, and the program's mission was to research and development very high speed integrated circuits. The United States Department of Defense launched the VHSIC program in 1980 as part of a joint tri service program, tri service being Army, Navy, and Air Force. Uh, you know, the program led to advances in integrated circuit materials, lithography, packaging, testing, algorithms, and it created numerous computer-aided design or CAD tools as well. Out of this hot mess fell FPGAs and the VHDL language. As I mentioned at the top of this, this is a horribly complicated topic at best, and you could literally run an entire channel dedicated to this subject alone. So I will show you how this is done, but not in this particular video. When we get to it, I'm going to gloss over uh, some of the details along the way, because even the simplest facets of how to get an FPGA working will take you down some crazy deep rabbit holes very quickly when you are first starting out. And so I'm going to put that in a separate video. So I will post a demonstration of how this works, uh, where we're going to make a very simple circuit and we will have a single input, which is a button, and you know the stuff goes the signal goes through the circuit and we'll have a single output, which is an LED. And the circuit will be wired up such that the LED lights up only when the button is pressed, right? Pretty simple. As you can probably guess, having knowledge of your specific FPGA chip is crucial. Now, so this is the one I have. It's an Altera Cyclone 2. Uh, yeah, there are also a number of new things that you're going to have to deal with when going into FPGA programming. And if you're going to get anywhere with this, then be prepared to spend a bit of time reading and scratching your head when you're first starting out with it. Yeah, you need to learn a new programming language uh, such as VHDL or Ver uh, Verilog HDL. You need to learn a new programming IDE such as Quartus. You need to learn some specifics about your particular hardware chip, uh, you know, like really deep specifics. And you also need to learn some new jargon and other basic concepts, which we will also cover in the next video. So if you do decide to go down this route, here's one caveat that I feel I should strongly point out. I'm using the Altera Cyclone 2, as I just mentioned, uh, simply because it was cheap. And, you know, I honestly don't suggest that you use an older chip like this. First, it's not supported, meaning that you have to buy things like USB blasters and then mess about downgrading your quarters to a version that remembers this old chip. And if you're like me and you'd like to tinker, that's fine. But I think the average person can save themselves a truckload of pain and hurt by spending a bit more money and get a more recent chip on a proper development board that is recognized by the more recent software. So I hope this has been an informative introduction into what an FPGA is and how it works without getting too bogged down in the absolute minutia. As I said, there will be a second video on this where we go and actually build something on the chip. Uh, so anyway, if you like these videos, give it a thumbs up. If you don't, give it a thumbs down. If you want to see more, please hit subscribe and I will speak to you soon. Bye.